Hey, peace world. I'm getting ready to get into uh, ah, ready to get this morning workout in. It's a Saturday. Actually, what? Oh, a couple of things to talk about, actually. But I mainly was going to get into the undercard of um, the Gamboa and, well, the Haney and Gamboa fight tonight down in um, in Florida. You know, the card is somewhat light, but, um, you know, it's not horrible. I think one thing to take into consideration is the fact that um, you know, this is Haney's comeback fight or return fight for um, 2020, I believe. Um, and he's coming off of the, show, of the shoulder surgery, too. Uh, so inactivity and a shoulder surgery. You know, he's coming back against a pretty, I mean, you know, a good name. He is an older guy. Um, and he's just trying to give us some, uh, you know, side-by-side -side comparisons of uh what how he looks against gamboa hey what's up fink what's good my man and um he's just trying to give you some side-by-side -side comparisons against probably the best option that he has available and that's in uh with, with gamboa having went what almost went the distance with um with tank davis last time out javante davis so Take what you want to take from that. Of course, uh, you know, Eddie Hearn, Bill Haney, the father of Devin, uh, they're running out with selling uh, Devin Haney as the best thing to watch in boxing, the future of boxing, how great he is, so on and so forth. I'm not disputing any of that. I'm just saying, you know, I was thinking on it earlier. I still don't really know what Haney's biggest strength is as a fighter. He's, I know he's well-rounded. He can box. He's got good size for the division. He might be kind of uh, short-lived for lightweight, but um, he's shown good power with the the knockout of Moran. Um, he had the shoulder injury out, the shoulder injury last time out, and didn't really get to finish that fight all that strong. But um, you know, we just need to see him against guys that we know somebody that we know so and, and like i said i just need to see him face some adversity the fortuna fight fell apart um shared already workflow listening i appreciate it bro um so that's that's it make take what you want to take from this fight or you know be excited about it don't be excited about it whatever it's up to you i'm gonna check him out tonight and tr like i said try to get an idea of what Devin haney is as a fighter you know um Teofimo Lopez has been able to take advantage of being on the undercards of some prominent names. And then he worked himself into the main event with Lomachenko and took care of business. I know what he is as a fighter right now. Um, Ryan Garcia, I still have questions about him. Um, the la I mean, you know, we need to see him get into, uh, especially since he's been with Eddie Reynoso. We haven't really seen him get deep into a fight and see what else he does besides stop somebody with the left hook. Um, Tank Davis. People are inserting him in the middle of their or at the top of their t uh, pound for pound list for stopping a guy we knew he was going to stop. Uh, yes, he's really talented, big puncher, explosive guy and whatnot. But is he... Is he a super featherweight or is he a lightweight? What the hell is he? I don't I don't know. Again, some of these guys are t dipping their toe in the water quite a bit and not swimming a lap. So I can see what you really are, really aren't. And, and then you hide behind the promoter, you know, and the fighter himself sometimes or herself sometimes barking about what they are and telling me that I need to accept them as that. I don't know what the hell you are. You, you, you're only fighting... If I don't know your if I don't know your opponents months before you name them as your opponents or years as you name them of the of as your opponent, I can't sit here in my right mind and get too excited about some of these people. Now he checked uh Davis checked that box with um with Leo Santa Cruz, but still most of us knew what we were going to get as the final result of that fight. I'm gonna watch the fight for the first time. I don't know if they're showing it tonight because they actually have the uh, 
the heavyweight, Luis Ortiz, is actually fighting. So I don't know if they're re-showing that tonight or not. But I'll get around to it. But I see a lot of people had Santa Cruz winning two or three rounds before he was stopped. So that ends, I mean, that asks some, or raises some questions within itself, you know. And then we don't know. Was 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 Tank more hittable? Heavyweight boxing would be good also tonight. Yeah, I'm going to try to check that out. I'm, I don't know where I am with really following Luis Ortiz too closely. I don't have anything against Luis Ortiz. Uh, I saw it was just a bo- it was just an article on boxing scene talking about um, he should have been able to continue against uh, Wilder uh, in that fight where he was dropped or stopped in the seventh round, I believe. Um, I don't think it really works like that. I think when you left laying under the bottom rope like that for a while, uh, all the water that was knocked off his head into the front row. Uh, I don't think you get to continue a fight after that, but he did get up, you know, but I don't think you get to continue after that. But, um, so anyway, that's the, that's the main event tonight. What I'm looking at is two things. I want to check out Philippe Hergovic. Um, I think he's a pretty interesting fighter. I'm not saying he's the future of the heavyweight division, but I think he has an interesting skill set. What I want to see from him is can he get a clean knockout? He's getting a lot of TKOs. Exactly. Right, L. Booker. Uh, He's getting a lot of TKOs. He stopped uh, Corbin and Eric Molina uh, with a TKO three win. I think that was on the rematch of uh, Anthony Joshua and Ruiz. But... um, you know, at heavyweight, we more or less want to see somebody account get counted out, or you know, the, the referee just stop counting at four or five, and it's a, it's a knockout. Uh, like I said, the fight with Corbin, and Corbin makes messy fights anyway. He 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 really kind of m- makes fights really messy. Uh, but the Eric Molina, again, it was. He was rocking Molina and and bullying Molina and doing what he was supposed to do. But it, like again, the fight ended in a TKO. Uh, I really want to see some um, some 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 raw power from the guy that leaves no question. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, Rydell Booker's never been stopped. He's six three. Uh, Philip Port Philippe Port Hergovich is six six. I think Rydell Booker is coming into this fight maybe 15, 12 or 15 pounds heavier than Hergovic. Um, uh, Booker lost the decision to Pulev last time out. Um, and then he also had the decision fight with Franklin. It was a couple big names for him. He also fought James Tony. Um, one funny thing that Rydell Booker said in the uh, in the press conference the other day you know, he's down there. Uh, they, they have to be in isolation at these bubbles, at these events. And uh, when he first came on, he says something about, if you know anything about my past, uh, this is no problem for me. Talking about, like, being in um, isolation when he was locked up, when he was behind the wall before. I thought that was kind of funny for him. But he's not a big puncher. I mean, he can box. He knows how to box and whatnot. Uh, like I said, he's never been stopped, so he's pretty durable. Uh, Philippe Ergovich came out and said that he plans to outbox him at first and then uh, figure out a way to get him out of there. So I want to see if he can live up to that, keep his word on that. Um, Like I said, Booker knows his way around the ring. He is, uh, I want to say he's 38 years old maybe. So um, it's just a chance for Ergovich to kind of let us know what what his game is. Um, can he, I mean, can Booker land some decent shots, test his beard out a little bit? Can he give Hergovich any kind of uh, adversity to work through? I don't know. We shall see. So that's one thing I'm interested on there. And then the other fight uh, is another heavyweight fight. Is uh, Zhili Zhang against Devin Vargas out of Ohio. Uh, Sylvania, Ohio. Vargas was like on the Olympic team with... Um, with the Andre Ward. Uh, he's a smaller heavyweight. He's 38 years old. In six of his losses, he's been stopped five times. So, uh, Zili Zhang, obviously, this is probably, probably you know, a part of match rooms or the zone, the combination of the two, kind of the pivot to being more uh, relying or focusing on global boxing uh, versus maybe just trying to, you know, cut out a path or cut out 
some territory in the U.S. And this guy is from China. I'm thinking he's like fighting out of China. The dude is based in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Uh, one thing for him, though, he is 37 years old. So it's kind of go time for him. You know, I don't know how long that he just recently signed to match room. I don't know how long that deal is. But, uh, yeah, 37 years old, like, he need to get past Vargas tonight and then do something in the next fight or two uh, to really have any to have any impact, you know, or have any type of meaningful career and whatnot. So, uh, Zhang is number 11 in the WBO. He's number 12 in the IBF. Uh, 21 and 0 with 16 knockouts. Vargas is 22 and 6 with nine uh, KOs. Uh, he's 38 years old, as I mentioned. Um, stopped by Ruiz as well as uh, Dominic Brazil to give you some background on him. Uh, you know, he can box a little bit, moves pretty decent. He, he's undersized and he is an older cat. Um, the one thing, though, and I'm going to get ready to get on off of here. Uh, just if you're kind of connecting dots event to event on December 12th, we'll see uh, Joseph Parker and Junior Fah. Two other heavyweights that are out there. And uh Vargas actually fought Junior Fi uh last November, I believe. I think that fight was on UFC Fight Pass, was where I saw that one. And it's just a chance to kind of see what uh Zhang does against Vargas, knowing that Vargas fought Junior Fi. And this this also kind of has me looking at Joseph Parker having some bigger expectations for him against Junior Fi because uh Vargas uh, hurt Junior Fi a couple times in their fight. Uh, Fi did knock down Vargas, I believe, twice and then went on to win by unanimous decision. But, um, you know, and I said this a couple of a year and a half or so ago when nothing was happening uh, with the heavyweights, when we couldn't get the fight between uh, AJ and Deontay. This was prior to um, to Tyson Fury coming along. But um, I was like, some of these different dudes, are, you know, they got to get opponents. They got to get ways to get better, stay busy, stay active, and, and improve their skills and kind of become a draw and, and find a way to work themselves into being considered, you know, for a title shot. Thinking that it was going to take some time before the two big dudes fought each other. That never happened. We saw that situation was wrecked. Then comes along Tyson Fury. And um, and now all of these guys are still scrambling to like fight meaningful fights, but uh, avoid a situation like dealing in white where you completely lose your spot in line once the big fights do play out. And there are uh, chances for some of these other guys to get into the, uh, the title picture and whatnot. So um, but the fight with, between Junior Fa and Vargas was a pretty good fight. Tyson Fury is scheduled to fight December 5th against Kaye Kaibayel. Yeah, yeah, they did go on and name that opponent. Um, yeah, I mean, that's going to be a... Uh, I mean, that, that one's a homecoming fight for Tyson Fury. Um, I don't know a whole lot about Kaibayel, Kaibayel, but... Um, he has a win against somebody notable or a name that I'm familiar with, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. But um, that's what I'm looking for tonight, to see what this Vargas cat can do against Zhang, who I think is pretty uh, Zhang. Did I write his, his height now? I think he has a pretty significant size advantage. Like I said, 21-0 with 16 KOs. I looked at his box rec. I didn't see any names there. Oh, he got a, a first round stoppage against Curtis Harper back in 2017. I believe Curtis Harper is the guy that left the ring uh, before facing um, uh, a jog book. Other than that, I didn't really recognize too many names on the guy's uh, record. Can he, you know, this, that's kind of the interest in the fight. What does he do against this, this former Olympian and this guy who's faced some decent names at heavyweight that we know? And then, um, like I said, maybe from Vargas, you have some kind of idea of what to expect with uh, Joseph Parker and Junior Five, December 12th. Another thing that I wanted to get to before I get on out of here, get back here on my workout. Um, I didn't even realize this. Um, I didn't. I forgot. I forgot that this card was coming up because I got off of social media. 
But last night in um, St. Petersburg, Florida, on the Impact Network, I keep meaning to remind myself to check out my channels that I have available to me to see if I have the Impact Net Impact Network on any of these apps that I, I use for TV. And uh, I keep forgetting. I think I just found out that I have Telemundo. Um, so I can check out some of those fights uh, that are that, that air on Telemundo. That's another place I can check out some boxing now. But Impact Network, um, I use YouTube TV and Sling. I don't think it's on either one of those. But um, last night they had a card. A Friday night card, uh, like I said, down in St. Petersburg, Florida. Shout out to Kaylee Reese. I've had her on the podcast or on the channel a couple of times. Um, I got a couple interviews with her down on the playlist. I talked to her back in February in uh, Hammond, Indiana. Uh, but she just won a WBA 140-pound total uh, title last night against Candy Wyatt. Uh, so shout out to her for getting back into uh, the championship pitcher. Uh, I'm not that familiar with Candy Wyatt, but I know they tried to make the fight between Kaylee Reese and um, her name just completely just left my mind. I saw her leaving too. Uh, damn, the one lady out, the older lady out in uh, Vegas on uh, Floyd Mayweather on Mayweather Promotions. I can see her face. She has shorter hair, but I cannot think of her name for nothing right now. Um, damn. But anyway, in that particular fight, maybe it'll come to me. They tried to make the fight with her, and uh, that's the one that that uh, Cecilia Brightcoos wouldn't fight. And um, they they tried to make this fight with Reese and her, and that's when um, the other lady, whatever I can't remember her name, she put the t she put the contract up online, and uh, was talking about how Lou DeBella has some return clause in there, and that's why she didn't want to take the fight. And then my man, the the the, uh, the former fighter who manages a lot of women right now, I can't even think of his damn name. You got to write all this stuff down before you get on here. Um, he got into the picture talking about that the clause was, the term was fairly common. Um, but the other lady was like, I only want the one fight with Reese. I don't want to fight multiple times with you or on your platform, or I don't want to work with you beyond this one fight. And it was some back and forth. Layla Carter. Layla McCarter, I think. McCarter. Layla Carter. I think it's McCarter. Layla McCarter is who I'm talking about. She didn't take the fight. Um, and then the, uh, the the cat from Empire uh, Empire Boxing or Empire Management wanted to trash her, saying how old she was and that nobody was really going to come looking for her with a similar opportunity. So she should have taken the fight uh, because she didn't have no choice. But Layla did not take the fight, and um, this Candy Wyatt ends up being the person, and Reese defeated her. Also on that card was Isaiah Steen out of Cleveland, Ohio, the half-brother of uh, super welterweight, uh, rising uh, super welterweight Charles Conwell. Uh, his brother Isaiah Steen got a, a fifth-round stoppage against Juan Deong Hill. Um, if you know, Isaiah Steen was supposed to fight a few weeks ago on that card with Conwell that aired on a Wednesday night on Showtime. Um, something happened with his opponent. I think his name was Henderson or something. Um, he, he didn't make, he didn't fight that night. So it's dope that he came back to get this fight against uh, Juan Deang Hill and get, get a fight in for 2020. Uh, so shout out to Isaiah Steen. I think I might have one interview on the channel with him. Um, you can check that out. And then also another name that was on that card is a new a, a heavyweight newcomer, Jeremiah Milton. He got a third round stoppage over uh, D'Angelo Swabby. Uh, Milton, he's really uh, he's really green. I mean, that was only his second fight. He fought a couple of months ago on the, on the uh, UFC Fight Pass when they did the, uh, the Salida Promotions had a. I think it might have been a Friday night card on UFC Fight Pass at Kronk Gym. Um, that was for Shishkin, I think, was the Vladimir Shishkin, I think, was the uh, the main event on that one. So um, Milton went on there and got a first round stoppage against some dead body uh, that took like two punches and was out of there. But Milton is uh, working with uh, the same trainer as... Um, 
Caleb Plant, Justin Gamber is his name. I think uh, Gamber is also training um, my man, uh, Junior. Uh, Sugar Shane Mosley's son. Yeah, he's training him. I like Gamber, too. I like... I, I like Gamber. And, you know, he, he's doing his thing with uh, Caleb Plant, who is in, you know, is being discussed as a f mid December opponent for um, for Canelo and whatnot. But uh, Jeremiah Milton, like I said, he's kind of coming out of nowhere. I think he's 6'4, maybe 230, 235 pounds. Uh, just working, just getting his feet wet, just figuring out what he is. And uh, it's dope to see him getting another fight in because prior to that fight that was on UFC Fight Pass, I think two fights fell apart for him. And right now, you know, a lot of guys, especially guys just coming into the game, uh, you know, just turning pros, this has to be a disheartening time to come into the game where you can't get fights. Uh, you know, you've dedicated yourself to becoming a fighter, you know, a professional prize fighter. And it was already hard for current pros to get a fight. Uh, and, you know, starting out, you know, it's business teams that are fronting these dudes money and helping them train. And, you know, those those fighters who are able to train full time uh, and be full time boxers, although you have no wins or losses, you know, it's some people behind you that at some point, you know, their pockets are hurting, too, right now. So how do you sit here and, uh, you know, fund a guy who's not bringing in any money right now and not advancing his career? It's putting a lot of these guys in some uh, some questionable situations, especially if you're not, you know, somebody like Duke Reagan, who I think is going to fight um, on the um, Terrence Crawford, Brooke. He's fighting on there. I think it'll be his third fight. He signed the top rank. And then Antonio Leonard promotions with um with with Jay Prince. There's some things in play that can help him out, you know, while he's working through this and as he's advancing and trying to get his career to, you know, up and running and and and, and get situated. There, there there's some some um there's some resources there for that. But somebody like Jeremiah Milton, who I know his uh he signed to Victory Sports Management, Mike Leonardi and um I can't remember the lawyer cat. Uh, from the East Coast, but uh, Leonardi is based out in Las Vegas. But um, yeah, it's it's good to see Milton get a uh, get a look. Isaiah Steen, he's another uh, Luda Bella kid, and then uh, Kaylee Reese. Like I said, she's I think with Empire Management. I think there might be some kind of actually, with, like I said, with the Bella handling the uh, the contract that was sent to Layla McCarter, it's some kind of. Um, co-promotional stuff with her and whatnot. But like I said, man, I want to look up this Impact Network because I think they've had two or three cards on there to this point. And, uh, you know, if it's a way to check out some boxing, I want to get an eye on it. Also, um, I keep throwing this reminder out there. I do have NBC Sports. And I think here in the next two weeks, they have that uh, Ring City USA is having his first card with Oshaki Foster. In the uh, in the main event, I think it's only going to be three fights on there, but it's live from the wild card gym out in um, Los Angeles, Freddie Roach's gym. So uh, that's somebody else stepping into the boxing uh, arena, providing more fights. Uh, so keep that in mind. You know, if you got to make some moves to figure out how to watch uh, NBC Sports or get familiar with where it is on your channel selection. You might want to start looking into that. I think Foster, I can't remember the name of his fighter, but I think it's a pretty credible opponent. And uh, Foster is a guy who um, who has some skill, who has some decent skills and is calling some of these guys out. But he's somewhat, you know, frozen. Out. And I can't, honestly, I can't remember if he's 126 or 130. I want to say he's 130, um, but I could I could be wrong. But um, I am looking forward to checking him out. <clears throat> He's had a, pr a couple of pretty interesting knockouts and whatnot, and he can fight. He can fight. He just, um, like I said, he's on the outside looking in. He's another one of these guys that I believe is with uh, DeBella, and DeBella hasn't been able to get a home uh, for his fighters and for his promotional uh, for DeBella Entertainment. So he's been... He's been being creative. Uh, I'm wondering, though, 
I'm wondering though, with uh, with Canelo Alvarez exiting um, Golden Boy and the Zone, uh, the Zone has some, um, you know, freed up some some money. Is it a chance where you know maybe something can come down the pipe for Debella? I know a lot of guys say some bad things about Debella, and you know, he ruffled some feathers or something while he was at HBO and whatnot, and you know, people say whatever. But I think um, I think in a, a new re, a new a revised relationship with the zone and the Bella at this point might not be a bad idea because I think I like listening to what Lou Bella talks about and how he his thoughts on what should be done or how thing how things should be gone about. Uh, the thing is though, it's easy to talk a lot of things in boxing, but it's it's a totally different challenge to make any of those things happen. And, um, but what he said in the past in some of the recent interviews and podcasts that I've heard him on, uh, it all makes sense to me. But again, you got to make sense to other people. Uh, and in boxing, you got to make it make sense to a number of different people for any one thing to happen. And so who's trying to be reasonable or not? I'll tell you one thing that's a little unreasonable already is listening to Mr. Uh, Ryan Garcia, who is holding steadfast on him calling shots at lightweight, despite the fact that he holds no title. And, uh, you know, he's trying to assert that somebody like a Devin Haney is not really a concern of him, although he's fighting this interim title fight with Luke with Luke Campbell, but uh, he's saying that Devin Haney is not a concern to him and really uh, Teofimo Lopez really isn't either. And and then even going to the extent to say that he wants to face Javante Davis, but Javante Davis really has to come see him because he would be the A-side against Javante Davis. So if you're already going into that discussion with that type of mentality, with that type of understanding of your value against a guy like Javante Davis, who is doing significant numbers right now. When you look at ticket sales, whether it be in Baltimore, whether it be what he did in um, in Atlanta, the fact that he just got 9,000 people in uh, in San Antonio at the Alamo Dome, the, uh, the pay-per-view numbers that came out were fairly successful. How do you sit here, and this was just yesterday, this was just yesterday on um, Sirius XM Fight Nation. Actually, it was Thursday. I think it was Thursday when he said this. But he said that he is firmly the A-side against Javante Davis. So if you want that fight, but you're going into it with that type of uh, belief in yourself, in your position, in, that ne in those negotiations, we're not, we're not going to see that fight. Because Javante is not fighting on the zone. Uh, so to say that you're the A-side in that situation just because you have four or five or whatever it is, million um, uh, Instagram fans and whatnot or what you do on social media, <clears throat> again, that makes, it's kind of no sense in looking into that, to that situation materializing as a fight, frankly. Um, so that's about it, man. Let me, I'm about, I'm about to get off of here. Enjoy the fight tonight. Like I said, it's not the greatest card per se. Um, maybe something exciting happens in the main event with, uh, with, um, Haney. Uh, we'll see what, uh, Gamboa, what version of him shows up. I think one thing that's very, that is one thing that's very discouraging with boxing is, is understanding injuries and, you know, Gamboa, the um the the um we don't know what the hell happened to his Achilles. Uh it's saying it was pulled, it was it was torn, it, whatever, whatever. Um but his shoe had an issue. But just trying to take that in, into consideration, uh, I don't even think he has surgery. I can't remember. Maybe he did have surgery. But um, I just know guys that weren't able to fight a fight 
after tearing an Achilles. You know, I mean, there's there's some injuries that you just can't uh, you just can't sustain and then fight through that. So I, I really don't know what the hell happened to his to his uh, to his foot, but um, and his you know his lower leg and whatnot. And then what kind of recovery did he go through? So like I'm trying to get excited about tonight, you know, and and, and have an idea of is he close to 100 percent is he 90 percent are there any lingering effects from 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 his foot the worst thing would be for him to get into the first round or two and there be some kind of recurrence of a lower leg injury of any kind in the same foot that would be horrific for uh for all parties for uh for devin for gamboa for the zone it would be a bad look for everybody so i'm just hopeful that um whatever he did have it's been a full recovery as far as we know of. Um, and that, that it's a, that it's a legit fight, you know, that, um, and then that Devin Haney looks good, you know, and if he gets the, 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 the uh, stoppage or he, or if he's truly dominant, um, you know, I guess he can look into the camera and talk some stuff to the other guys out there. Um, but it seems like, it seems like business is gonna get in the way of any of us seeing this group of young, uh, this group of young fighters, whether it be from any. I guess you know we got to look at it from 130 with uh, with Javante, 135 with Garcia and Haney, and possibly uh, Teofimo Lopez, who believes that he has nothing left to prove at 135 and is moving, making his way to 140. So. Uh, and as you know, that that has well, I won't even get into all of that. Let me get on out of here, man. Enjoy it. En enjoy the fights tonight. Uh, check out the action on whether it's Fox or Fo uh, FS1 with um, with the big man uh, with with Luis Ortiz. Um, I have not got a chance to check out that Wednesday night fight that came on FS1. Uh, Staniotis. Iamontes Stanionis against uh, Justin Deloach. I saw the highlights on it. I've been meaning to catch a replay of it. Um, I like Stanionis, man. I like his game. Um, I thought he was with uh, Ronnie Shields. I don't know if that's still who he's with or whatnot, but um, I was shocked to see Justin Deloach, now that I think about it. I was shocked to see D Justin Deloach uh, down at 147 who – came on the scene, I believe, as a super welterweight and worked his way up to being in the in the championship pitcher or the uh, co the contender pitcher for 154 be th before things uh, went sideways for him after the fight with uh, Gallimore, with, with, with Nathaniel Gallimore. But um, it's always interesting to see a fighter at a certain age or after a certain number of fights and you go back down to a weight class that we either haven't seen you fight at before or we haven't seen you fight at recently, which is something that we're seeing with Kell Brooks. Kell Brook uh, on the 14th, I believe. Um, but he got dominated by Stanny Stanio Stanioness. Uh, so I got to check that out. I think he was knocked down twice, uh, but he was getting rocked by a lot of the kids' punches and um, – Good win for Stanley Ognis. You know, he's he's one of these um the youngsters at you know the new the new group that'll be coming along at welterweight once some of these older cats move out of the way. Speaking of older cats, I know I said I was getting ready to get off here. Um what do you think about hearing um uh, what's his name? Talk all greasy now. Keith Thurman. He sounds like uh foghorn leghorn a little bit. The rooster or the, the the big rooster from uh Looney Tunes or whatever. Cause he, you know, he's he's from Florida and whatnot. But um he was on the radio this week responding to Errol Spence Jr. saying F him and that Errol Spence really didn't have any desire to fight him. And it's just crazy now because here it is two years later. Uh, you know, Keith Thurman is calling everybody boy, referring to everybody as boy, and he's he's talking up uh Danny Garcia and talking about Philly Brick that Errol Spence Jr. should avoid getting hit by Philly Brick. And um we just haven't heard anything aggressive or uh 
um, we haven't really heard Keith Thurman hunting for a fight. You know, when he had the two titles or when he had his title before he lost the, uh, you know, the WBA to, to, um, to Manny Pacquiao, he's just been able to sit back and deflect and, and, and be, uh, you know, just deflect and not, you know, not address anything, not commit to anything. But now he's out here seriously trying to chase down a fight with Errol Spence, who I don't blame. You know, I was in, I was at Barclays a couple of years ago now. Uh, when they brought out, I think some of it is on the playlist down below, but I was there when they brought in, they brought in Errol Spence Jr. and um, Keith Thurman, and they had them sitting on, you know, the two sides of the stage. And you could tell then that Errol Spence Jr. really didn't have a lot of, he wasn't too fond of Keith Thurman. And Thurman was talking about, I got the audio, I need to find that. But he was talking about, you know, people don't really understand that he loves a great effing fight. He was like, people think that he didn't want to fight uh, Errol Spence. This was two years ago. And he was saying people don't think, people don't realize how great uh, a real effing fight is. Implying that he really, he couldn't wait to get in the ring with Errol Spence Jr. But that never materialized. And again, what I was just saying with, with the way that injuries are reported and discussed in boxing it's not like the professional uh the major sports where there's an injury report we don't know what the, we didn't we didn't know what the hell was wrong with keith thurman for two years or a year and a half uh but the dude wasn't fighting anybody you know and like i said for him to come out now and 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 be all lively and and talking trash and downplaying everybody um but I, I don't think that fight happens. And like I said, like I was just saying, I I, I think uh, Errol Smith Jr. would be. What what does what does Keith Thurman bring to the table at this point, to um, to make you you know you, to make anybody want to go fight him, knowing that you froze him out back in the day when when it was. You know, they, I, it was two times I was at Barclays and they brought in Errol Spence Jr. before he got the fight with uh, Kel Brook. And you could tell that he was pissed off. Uh, they had Debella up there talking and trying to explain things. And um, dude was just sitting there and had to fight, had to beat up uh, Lamont Peterson because there was nothing, there was, there was no nowhere for him to really go, you know, next and advance his career and whatnot. So to turn around now and think that he would really, um, you know, give Keith Thurman a shot, I don't see that happening. But it's just it's, it's it's easy to see how uh, the shoe is on the other foot now, and like I said, Keith Thurman is outside looking in, and you have to be vocal, because a lot of guys, <clears throat> a lot of guys over on on the PBC, a lot of those guys don't really call out anybody. You're kind of buying, I mean, taking a, a page out of Floyd's playbook. You just sit around and just wait for things, you know, for the pieces to get moved around for you, and then you fight whoever. But a lot of guys over there, with the exception of a, of one or two guys, I know Caleb Plant has been has been vocal about getting a fight with Benavidez. He no longer has to chase that. He has something better to do. But a lot of those guys, um, <coughs> the Charlo brothers, I don't really call anybody. A lot of them just kind of let things happen. <coughs> but um you could check that article i mean you could check that interview out on um it might be on the zones uh youtube page <coughs> excuse me that's uh that that was keith thurman with ock and barack they might have talked for like 15 minutes and like i said man it was just interesting hearing thurman being desperate being desperate i think at the end he might have came around at the, before he got off of there <clears throat> Excuse me, I should have brought uh, They had him, um, what was he saying? Oh, I think he called out, I think he said realistically, damn, I thought he said Yugas, you guys, or was one other fighter. It was like two names that he gave. And then all in all, I will say this, I think, I thought Keith Thurman kept it a buck. And saying, um, 
in all reality, he couldn't face. There was it, it, it wasn't really uh, realistic for him to get a look with Errol Spence until 2021. So I think he talked his trash and tried to to build that fight up and his opportunity up. But he did come back at the end of it and say that um, he was he was cognizant of of the fact that he didn't have a, a legitimate claim to a fight until. Uh, a couple of things were cleared up with where uh, with with the opportunities that Errol Smith Jr. has in front of him. So I think he did two things. You know, he 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 poked the bear and, and and got his name back in the mix. And um, but then came out and let you know that he 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 has a a, a real um, understanding of kind of things would need to fall in, into place for him to get that that fight. I'm going to get on off here because I'm starting to cough. Y'all have a great day, man. Thanks for rocking with me. Thanks for those couple of likes. Uh, Bite down boxing. Don't let them count you out. Peace.